our next episode of Big Data Talks, in which we have conversations with industry experts in which the way data, machine learning, and artificial intelligence are changing the way we live. My name is Jan Willem Middelberg, and I will be your host today. I'm the author of the Enterprise Big Data Framework, which is hosting this series of Big Data Talks. You can always watch back the recording of this discussion on YouTube, the Big Data Framework website, and the podcasting platform on Apple Podcasts. I'm really thrilled to be joined today by, by Avijit Dutta, who is the Technical Director for Big Data and Artificial Intelligence at Globant. Avijit is responsible for managing the data and analytics and AI studios for capacity, talent acquisition and manifestation, innovation technology evaluation, and consultation. In this job, Avijit is needed, needs to evaluate the latest technologies to apply them in a business domain, which is an incredibly complex task. And that is something that we're definitely going to explore in more detail today. During his career, Avi has been involved in the mobile, as a mobile app architect for the Disney theme parks, something that as a big Disney fan, I'm keen to learn a little bit more about. It is my great pleasure to welcome Avi Dutta to the Big Data Talks today. Thank you so much, Avi, for taking the time to join us today. Avi, it's such a great pleasure to have you on Big Data Talks today, and I really don't know where to begin because I want to ask you so many questions today. But maybe just to start very simple, can you tell us a little bit about what Big Data Analytics Studios at Globans are doing? Sure. So thank you so much, Jan, for the uh, gracious introduction. Uh, I'm very excited to talk to you today uh, in this series of Big Data Talks. Um, so where do I begin? I mean, talking about uh, the Data and AI Studio at Globant, uh, if I have to you know, map it to your uh, big data, uh, I mean, framework, I would put it as a, a, a big data function, uh, but it is basically an, uh, an expansion of not just a center of excellence, but it is something which is more uh, geographically diverse. And that is what uh, studios at Globant um, is, is, is uh, meant about, because uh, the whole thought process what was how can we come out of the center of excellences which are more geographically constrained to a more uh, to a more cross continental kind of a structure which helps us to have deep pocket of expertise in terms of technology uh, latest trends uh, and hence drive creativity and uh, innovation across. Now uh, talking about uh, data and AI studio, um, uh, see over, over the past fifteen years we have been helping our customers to you know, discover, define, uh, and develop data strategies and data products uh, that are very, very well aligned towards uh, the business needs. Uh, we help them to create an ecosystem where the business strategy is at the core and uh, data strategies is, is, is created in complete consonance with it. Now, this is taking into account the most important ingredients uh, to achieve it, which are people, processes, and culture are together uh, uh, working in a, in a closed ecosystem. Now, uh, once all these three are, are getting mapped together, uh, it helps us to create data platforms which can further evolve as data products, which can be you know, AI models, chatbots, uh, finance terminals, uh, API services, to name a few. Um, and we achieve this through a variety of service offerings, uh, which are data strategy, data platforms, data as products, insights, and MLOps. Now, through our various uh, roles in the form of data strategists, data architects, data scientists, data analysts, uh, we provide an extensive and integrated ecosystem which helps our customers to augment their businesses by working with them. Um, one last thing to mention, we also partner with the major key players in this space, which uh, predominantly acts as a catalyst to constantly augment innovation, learning, and spearhead the digital transformation journey for our customers through data. Very good. So that's a, a lot that you're actually doing <laughs> at Globant. Um, am I correct that you are also uh, the initiation? So you're in this process with clients to um, um, basically educate them on the process of how can you use data in a more consistent and in a more innovative way and how you can you use these newer technologies to, to create and develop new products. So it, it's really... Um, a strategy uh, towards all the way towards implementation. Is that correct? 
Absolutely, absolutely correct. I mean, the the, the whole thought process uh, uh, circles around uh, the the business strategy, and then based on that, uh, the data strategies is formed uh, from a long term perspective. Yes, and and that's uh, exactly what I would like to uh, explore a little bit more with you in in this big data talks episode today. So, as you know, in in uh, this podcast and in this this video. We always focus around the way in which big data, machine learning, and especially AI are, are changing the world in which we're living today. As someone who really leads teams in this area, where, in your opinion, do you see the most significant changes? Sure. So, uh, see, I'm, Jan, I mean, as we know, uh, we are living in a generation which is uh, predominantly focused on uh, digital and cognitive transformations. Uh, for any businesses, right? I mean, th th there is no business, in my opinion, which will not be touched upon by any of these two things. Now, such transformations are uh, nothing but a result of sustaining innovations, uh, which helps organizations to have a consistent edge over the competition. Now, you know, uh, in my opinion, there can be no digital or cognitive transformation without data. In fact, I believe data is at the core of the entire ecosystem to achieve these transformations uh, rather consistently and repetitively. In fact, uh, one one key highlight which I would like to mention, uh, last week we did a web conference at uh, Globant, uh, which was predominantly focused on data and AI. Uh, it was called as DNX 2021. And uh, the theme of this conference was uh, digital primacy through data and AI. And the reason why we chose this theme uh, is because we believe we are living in a generation which has transitioned from uh, digitization to digital transformation. And now we are realizing that <clears throat> just the transformations are not sufficient. Uh, in fact, we have to all augment ourselves to transcend to the next level in this journey and achieve some, something which is called as uh, digital primacy. Now, this is to take the entire digital transformation journey one step further by augmenting businesses to achieve something which was just an imagination before, right? Uh, enhancing the liaison between business and technology in a way that both not only complement each other, but also augment together. And in my opinion, uh, a true digital primacy can be achieved uh, only when we don't repeat the same mistakes, we fail fast, we experiment more, we adapt to the ever-changing ecosystem, uh, right? ever-changing business needs, its value proposition, its offerings, and uh, fine-tune the strategies to develop uh, a true data-driven and alive ecosystem. Exactly, and, and so that's uh, something I would like to explore with you a little bit more in detail because there's so much talk around now on how do you get an organization data-driven and um, what are the, the key aspects that you would need to think about. Um, before I'm going to pick your brain a little bit more on, on that, I'm always very interested to know, you know, how did you end up in this domain? When you and I went, went to school, things like big data didn't exist at all, um, let alone artificial intelligence. That was something that, at least at my university, that, that was not a word that was mentioned at that time. And that was always uh, considered the far, far distant future. So I'm really curious to, to learn a little bit of, on, on what has been your journey. How did you end up specializing and ultimately now becoming the director of big data and AI? Sure. So, uh, Jan, I think the, the journey has been an incredible journey, I would say. And, I, and you, as you rightly said, uh, way back uh, when we were at, uh, at the school, uh, during that time, uh, unfortunately, uh, the academics that we, that we used to study, uh, it was not having uh, anything particular in terms of uh, big data or artificial intelligence and whatnot. Uh, it was more on the theoretical aspects of things uh, rather than the application side of things. But then, um, you know, as I uh, embraced myself into the uh, information technology uh, journey, I did, I did, I was always intrigued and curious about, you know, how the recommendation engine works at uh, Amazon per se, right? How does Amazon even knows that uh, I have bought a pair of shoes uh, now and I might not be requiring that for the another, uh, uh, another year or so. Uh, now, in that case, uh, how does that entire recommendation thought process works in the background? Uh, very recently, I mean, if you see the way um, with the augment of the OTT platforms, whether it is Netflix or whether it is Amazon Prime, the way the, the movie recommendation things are working, um, it is, this is absolutely incredible the way uh, these companies are augmenting the user experience, right? So it is majorly uh, business to consumer user experience, which is, uh, which is in the focus here. And this has 
truly transformed um, the thought process from a business perspective and a user experience perspective as well. And this is something which has always intrigued me and made me curious about uh, learning the, the nitty-gritties of how this is being achieved. And that's how I have landed uh, myself into the space. Good. So I really like what you're saying about learning and how do you make sure that you keep up to date with all of these latest trends in big data and artificial intelligence. So as the technology is constantly evolving, what do you do within your company to make sure that all of your teams are being kept up to date? What, what's your view on that? Sure. So, uh, I mean, as you rightly mentioned, big data is a space or artificial intelligence is a space that has been constantly evolving for so many years now. And it is incredibly difficult to, you know, uh, have an expertise on all the areas at, at one go. I think that that is not even an intention. The whole thought process is how can you really add value to the business uh, in the in the optimal time with the right set of technologies and tools and people. So one key element that we uh, always uh, augment uh, within ourselves is uh, learning. So we have uh, Global University as a platform. Uh, which is, you know, in consonance with uh, the thought leadership as well as uh, technology leadership, uh, where, you know, uh, people can upskill themselves uh, with any new technology which is coming in, this, uh, in the data and AI space or any other space as well. And other important thing is we do experimentation a lot, right? I mean, we do a lot of innovation in terms of, uh, uh, you know, evaluating latest technologies. As I mentioned earlier, that we do partner with some of the key players in the industry as well. Uh, so we transform our, our own thought process in the technology space based on how the industry is evolve, evolving as well. So the experimentation, constant experimentation, failing fast, uh, you know, making that, uh, making that as a true ecosystem for people to uh, learn constantly, right? So that is a part of our culture. Uh, and that is what we take ultimate pride in. And, you know, uh, other element is we don't reinvent ourselves. So let's say uh, if you are, if you are uh, working with one customer for some uh, transformation journey, uh, we utilize that learning uh, in, in some other implementations as well. So that's how, that's how we keep on uh, augmenting ourselves. We keep on learning new, uh, new elements. We keep, keep on appraising ourselves in terms of the technology space. And very importantly, having a license, as I mentioned previously, uh, license between technology and business is something which is uh, which is paramount. Uh, so we do inculcate uh, this thought process among people that it is okay for writing some code, but what does that code is actually meant to be doing, right? Not from a functionality perspective, but also what business problem uh, is it really really solving? Uh, because that is one element in my opinion is uh, is missing in this industry where people can be you know excellent data scientists, data architects. But if they're not able to, you know, uh, uh, get get proper thought process with the overall business strategy, uh, we are missing something uh, in the two ends of the bridge. Yeah, absolutely. But um, what I'm always curious about, because there's such a variety of different techniques and such a variety of different things that you can think about, especially in the design of algorithms. So with your teams, how do you ensure that there is a level of consistency? How do you ensure that there is a, a, a uniform way of working and that people have still some form of standardization that they could utilize across projects and would be your company DNA, basically. Absolutely. So talking about the DNA, right? I mean, as I was explaining about uh, the way the data and AI studio works at Globant, uh, we have different practices, as I was mentioning. We have data strategy, data platforms, uh, data as products, uh, uh, you know, uh, so these these different practices or services uh, are are being executed across different different uh, client uh, projects. Not only that, you know, we when I said I mean we are doing some experimentation or let's say innovation uh, in any of this space. Let's say uh, the evolution of data warehouse to data lakes, uh, from data lakes to lake house, and and now uh, the the next big thing which is data mesh. So how does this augmentation has happened, and how does that match? to Globant's value proposition from data and AI perspective. Uh, this helps us to, you know, constantly understand uh, what should be the value proposition from uh, from our organization for our, for our customers and how can we how can we constantly upskill our engineers to be prepared for uh, for those elements, uh, for, for, for the new technologies as well. So the way we do it consistently is through our practices. And, and are your engineers, are, are you then um, organizing by more functional knowledge? So meaning you have different teams that are working on strategy and then there's different en engineers working on 
developing the solution? Or do you try to get more of a cross-functional approach that the same person that is writing the strategy is also guiding towards implementation and support? What's the model so, that you prefer? So in, in terms of thought process, it is more of cross-functional. Uh, and the whole reason is uh, not to have stagnation uh, in people. Okay. Uh, to, to do just one kind of uh, mundane work over and over again. And uh, this also helps uh, uh, people to, you know, augment their careers in the right format. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I would be happy to mention about augmented career path at Globe and where, you know, data engineers can evolve their, uh, their career path from becoming, uh, you know, data architects, uh, all the way up to data scientists or principal data scientists. So, uh, the roles at Globant is, is more, uh, you know, uh, more cross-functional, cross-domains. We don't, we don't, uh, we don't hire people just based on their specific knowledge on the domain. Of course, that is important uh, to understand the business use case. But then, as far as the engineering teams are concerned, uh, in the data and AI space, we have people who are data engineers, data architects, which predominantly focus on, you know, insertion, storage, transformation, and processing specific things, creation of the data pipelines. Then we have business intelligence uh, developers who predominantly focus on uh, ETL data warehousing, uh, data visualization and reporting. And then last but not the least, we have data scientists, uh, which majorly deals with the uh, creation of the data models, uh, which, which will help in predictive and prescriptive analytics. So uh, now all, all these three roles are different uh, as far as the normal culture is concerned, but then we don't limit people just to be in that space itself. Uh, so they can work in agile teams uh, and they can very well play the role of uh, their counterpart uh, if the counterpart is not available uh, for whatever reasons. Or if this, uh, let's say if a data engineer wants to augment his or her career to become a data scientist in the future. Um, and we have successful uh, cases in this format as well where people, has, people have definitely uh, augmented their careers and they're doing uh, absolutely wonderful. So, so the whole purpose is to really make sure that there are becoming more knowledgeable on a cross-functional path, right? And, and I agree with, with, that, with you fully on that. that um, and that's also what I've been seeing in, in the projects around me, is making sure that people have more knowledge in a broader domain is typically more uh, valuable, especially within the big data domain than just being a specialist in this tiny little area. Absolutely. Good. Um, I want to pick your brain a little bit uh, deeper around something else. Um, I know that, um, and that's also one of the, the key reasons that I wanted to talk to you today, is that you're in charge of managing very complex, um, very large big data and AI projects for some of the, the largest brands that are existing in the, in the world. So you have a lot of experience in, in this field, and I would like to dive a little bit deeper into this because I, I do think that that is going to be a, a subject that for our listeners or viewers is going to be extremely interesting. So that is how do you manage complexity within these big data and AI projects? Um, any advice on, on where to start in the first place? So, so uh, managing large and complex projects is not easy. And that's why they are called as complex. So the, the, <laughs> sure the, <it> <laughs> The, the, the first the first key element is, uh, you know, I mean, so circling back to what I was mentioning earlier, to understand the business uh, strategy or business use case of the customers. See, more often than not, uh, uh, organizations make uh, a mistake that, you know, they, they, they presume that, uh, you know, their customers already have the business strategy uh, created or business strategy is already formed. But you never know. I mean, with the with the augment of technologies, we talk about digital transformations and whatnot, right? Uh, sometimes technology also drives uh, some of the business KPIs, and we have seen it uh, at multiple places. You talk about Netflix, you talk talk about Uber. Uh, these are these are these are transformations uh, in those uh, respective areas. Um, so managing complex projects uh, start with top down for sure in terms of thoughts, uh, understanding the business strategy, and uh, we definitely evangelize something called as uh, uh, data-driven uh, discovery. Uh, yeah. And this data-driven discovery helps us to, you know, uh, not only discover the data side of things, but basically some, uh, basically understanding the business KPIs that the customer is uh, uh, is interested in. And does the customer have sufficient data to complement uh, that business KPI? Uh, you know, formation of the channels, formation of the pipelines, formation of uh, the teams uh, to build those pipelines and creating those insights is uh, is definitely important, but that's more of the implementation details. Uh, the major thought process is 
to help the customer to uncover the business KPIs and then do a back trace uh, to, you know, uh, to understand do we have the, the respective data sources available in order to meet those KPIs and then formation of those teams. So if I have to give you one line of statement, I would say uh, outside in, uh, That's right, yeah. the, the, the blessing of the CIO and the CDOs um, uh, to understand the business uh, well and then inside out in terms of implementation where you start small, you cannot really uh, tackle a data strategy project all at one go. Uh, you cannot make big, big decisions all at one go. Uh, so that's the thought process that you start small and you you know keep on uh, you keep on iterating it, uh, showcase value and see if you are moving in the right uh, right direction. That's where the big data processes comes very very handy. All right. So the the data uh, data driven discovery, if if, uh, if I repeat it correctly, um, and that you mentioned, that kind of sounds like um, a way in which you have provided some standardization towards that whole project. So is that something that you're using across the board for, let's say, all of your clients? Or do you do you tailor it more, let's say, on an individual case-by-case -case basis? So, see, you know, uh, from global perspective, uh, <clears throat> the data and AI uh, studio has a service ecosystem as we sell it to our customers. Um, the baseline is data. The baseline is business strategy, as I was talking about. Yeah. Now, on that business strategy, we, we we start forming the data strategy. So, business strategy with, without business strategy, no data strategy can be formed. So, that they are the, completely interwoven, right? That are both are completely interwoven. And when we talk about data strategy, it is nothing but it's a combination of people, culture, and processes. Now, when you align all these things together, it it evolves. Uh, to the next step, which is creation of data platforms, right? Which then further evolves to creation of data products. So if you see, this is basically uh, a service ecosystem. And again, I did not mention about, uh, 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 you know, additional elements, which are also important in terms of data governance, data security, metadata management, and whatnot, which are nothing but a part and parcel of the entire ecosystem. But at a very high level, if I if I have to draw the, uh, the, the, the flow diagram, uh, it is like, the business strategy on the uh, business strategy on the bottom across then you form the data strategy uh, that transcends towards data platforms that transcends towards uh, data products so this is although works in most of the cases uh, but you know at, at times when we do discover that some of the data strategy has to be augmented in a different way uh, then we do calibrate uh, this service offering in a different format as well but i would say most of the time this this definitely works well Good. So, um, and, and that brings me kind of to my next question, because um, with many of these larger projects, um, uh, although the business strategy could be there and it could have been uh, well-defined, then always comes the question of data. You know, which data do we have? Where is it accessible? But maybe even more importantly, is the data that we have access to, is that any good? Is it valid? Is it, um, as, as we call um um, is there a high level of veracity? Can we trust the data that's actually in the databases of our clients? So how do you deal with that in the projects that you are encountering? How do you make sure that the data that is used in those projects is actually something that you can base your decisions on? Sure. So data accuracy and data veracity is one is, uh, is the major challenge in this industry, right? I mean, uh, uh, there's a famous, famous saying, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, and if you if you really want to uh, augment the true capability of your business, uh, you need to you need to ensure that you have reliable data at at, at first, right? So and you know uh, understanding the source systems, understanding the target systems, understanding uh, uh, how the source systems are generating those data, how are we capturing those data? Do we have a common data model in place or unified data model in place uh, through which all the source systems are you know complying to those common standards, so to speak. Uh, so that we get the requisite quality of data. So basically cleansing of data and wrangling of data becomes much more important. Uh, and again, as I said, uh, this cannot be just on the test data set. So this is something which has to be done on the production data set, right? Yeah, more often than not, we have seen that you do you develop everything, and every, uh, I mean, you develop the entire pipeline, you develop visualization reports, and that works excellently well, well with the test data set. But the moment uh, you open the production data set, and then uh, things start to fail. So somewhere having a, a, a close thought process in terms of creating a common data model, a unified data a capture strategy, right, uh, or data collection strategy definitely helps 
you to put those constraints in the system uh, through which you know that whatever enter whatever data enters into the system uh, is of the requisite quality and will have some value uh, through which it can map to the respective uh, visualization. Okay. So one of so the reason I'm, I'm asking this is because in, in, from my experience there has always been these two challenges. One is is the data is actually uh, accurate and does that give us a right indication of the results? The other part is obviously always the model. And when I started my career in data science, um, one of the main challenges I found is there is dozens of different algorithms, maybe even hundreds. And there's always different approaches that you could take. And some models are more suited or better suited for one particular problem versus a model that is more suited for another kind of problem. So um, in the whole world of, of machine learning and all of the, I would say, hundreds of algorithms that exist, how do you um, guide or discuss with teams what is the best version and, and how do you do that model building in your company? Sure. So uh, especially in, on that, uh, then the first thought process is to identify the problem, right? Uh, identify the business problem, right? And uh, if you see uh, as far as artificial intelligence or machine learning goes, uh, you can classify, I mean, you, you can basically uh, categorize the problem into three different uh, types, whether, whether, whether it is a classification problem or, it, or if it is a regression problem or if it is a clustering based problem. And then you have uh, specialized algorithms in each of these three areas. The first and primary thought process is uh, to identify what type of problem you're trying to solve. Now, will it will that problem be tackled by uh, any specific algorithm in these three areas or maybe a combination of two different algorithms? Uh, between two different uh, supervisor and supervised learning thought processes, right? So that is the first and preliminary step. Second, second important thing is to you know map the model metrics with the business metrics. I think this one uh, one step which is which you know, which, you know uh, sometimes I feel is missing, um, uh, especially from the business side also where they are not able to uh, you know uh, give the right thought uh, right uh, KPIs to the data scientist. That they want to uh, they, that they want to achieve. So no matter uh, what algorithms, uh, how accurate algorithms uh, the data scientists are going to write, uh, but if it is not solving a business problem, it is of no use. So mapping the a very model point, and, and I think that that might already be one of the key takeaways from today's session because that's so true. Um, you can come up with those best classification algorithms that are out there, but it's still not a guarantee that that will fix the original business question and. Having that ability to specify it um, is, is I, indeed, I think, one of the things that is so, in many cases, uh, lacking all of the time. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, you know, the next step is uh, is is, uh, is is focusing on modeling uh, options. So whether it is cloud-based or, or if it is a pre-trained model or if it is a transfer a transfer learning based model. So you know, there are. Multiple pre-trained models, which are which are, which are out there. You talk about TensorFlow Hub, or you talk about uh, a Torch Hub. Uh, so, uh, what we advocate to our data scientists also that you first of all evaluate those models, and if those models are not really uh, you know uh, helping us with the with the with the right use case that you are uh, intending to do, then only go ahead with a custom model development because. Uh, do you then uh, use trial and error? So um, you just yes. eliminate based on accuracy or, or, or forecasts that are more relevant? Absolutely. So, so you know, as I said, right, uh, the, the, the model metrics and business metrics has to map, to, map together. And then uh, based on the accuracy of the model that is out there um, and does not need any kind of reinvention, and it is helping us to, you know, uh, um, getting the, the, the requisite business metrics also optimally, right? Uh, is the right model to be chosen, right? Sometimes the customization of model is fine, but then uh, the thought process should not be to create a new model uh, all from beginning. And you know, uh, last and but not the least important, uh, uh, least thing that I would like to mention is not all problems are data science problems. And one of the key uh, responsibility that a data scientist also has is to you know talk to business. That hey, your business KPIs or your business problems is not, is not solvable through the uh, through the artificial intelligence uh, ecosystem thought process, right? So you talk about uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, you know, model building, but then uh, sometimes business are so much intrigued about 
using these technologies uh, just to just to be on top notch side of the technology but but some things are not really solvable your, your data has a lot of noise and you know that it is it is a uh, true wastage of time to you know uh, do any kind of predictive or procedural analytics so identifying when not to use artificial intelligence also becomes a key responsibility of the data scientist that's a really interesting train of thought because um Machine learning, artificial intelligence is always positioned as kind of the holy grail. It's going to solve all of the business problems uh, if we're using in that direction. So how do you hold that mirror back towards the business saying, um, you know, we've looked at, at your requirements, we looked at your wishes, but this is actually not possible to solve. How, how do you bring that message and how do you do that? That messaging is not easy, to be very honest, because more often than not, uh, businesses uh, do believe that if this is done somewhere else, this can be done here as well. Uh, so like what you said, trial and error is the best mechanism where we, uh, you know, uh, do some kind of inferences uh, analytics and, and, and make sure that we educate them that, hey, this is what is doable, this is what is not doable. Or let's say uh, this is doable with some constraints, right? I talked about uh, uh, having a having lot of noise in the data. So let's say if business is expecting to have certain KPIs uh, out of the box, uh, that might not be uh, possible with their existing data source. So maybe some kind of fine tuning has to be made uh, by the data engineers and whatnot. So, so you're using data you... to show what is possible versus what is impossible. So Absolutely. it's basically to have a data-driven decision again Absolutely. around why Absolutely. something is or isn't a good idea. It's kind of a, 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 the whole circle round, isn't it? Yes, it, it does, totally. Good. So we've been talking a lot about um, algorithms and um, I've been studying algorithms probably for the last decade right now. And I've come across very many that uh, I sometimes find beautiful. I sometimes find them fascinating. Uh, in many cases, I find them very complex. Um, and one of the, my favorite questions always in these interviews is, do you have a favorite algorithm? Uh, and if so, which one and why? Wow, that's a that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> I mean, as you rightly said, there are too many out there. Um, I would pick two uh, okay. if I really have to pick. Uh, one thing is uh, the multivariate regression. Yeah. Um, and and the reason I I really love this is uh, uh, back to what I was mentioning that how did I get into this space or uh, at first place, right? So how does multivariate regression works through you know uh, multiple predictor uh, variables, right? And then um, how does it really come up with a, uh, you know, a re recommendation format? So this is something which is being used exhaustively in most of the uh, recommendation engine these days as well. And uh, the other one, if I have to put, is uh, the random forest classifier. Um, once again, the reason I pick up this one is majorly because uh, when I see some of the financial frauds happening, uh, this is one of the uh, key uh, uh, key algorithm which helps you to classify a transaction as fraud or non-fraud, and of course its accuracy is much more better than the um, the graph one, right, or, or or the the decision tree one, right. So so these are the top two picks that I would like to uh, mention. Oh, well, uh, very as, good. As I, I think I'm going to make a scoreboard of what everyone says, and then maybe after we are at episode 100, then we will know what is the the, the favorite algorithm. But yeah, I Absolutely. agree with you, and especially especially what you mentioned on and the simplicity, uh, and that's also what I, I like about uh, that algorithm is because mm -hmm. it really is also easy to explain toward uh, towards the business. Absolutely. Um, I'm, personally, I'm also a very big fan of, of the first one uh, you mentioned, multi-feature regression analysis, because um, determining which features in a data set actually tell you something, yes. I think that that is still one of the the most uh, interesting parts that, that we come across within data science. So uh, After, and, thank you so much and, you know, for sharing that. Totally, totally, Jen. And just one more point to add, I think the data speaks to you and uh, and these algorithms just helps you to form that interface where you can just really see uh, what each data has to uh, offer uh, yeah. in terms of its values. Yeah, I, I still, even after all those years, I still think it's kind of like magic. You know, something goes in one side and then all, all, with all this computation, um, with certain high levels of accuracy, we can say, you know, this is the best solution, or this is fraud, or this is most likely to be your next purchase or the next movie you're gonna watch. So yeah, um, maybe that's the reason I'm in this business in the first place. Absolutely. Um, 
one of the other things that I wanted to discuss with you is that um, within the domain, there's always a lot of discussion around big data versus artificial intelligence. Where's the difference? Where is the overlap? Can I, can I ask you, what, what's your opinion on that? So, so I think big data is an ocean and uh, artificial intelligence is kind of an island with, uh, with a five-star hotel on that. Uh, <laughs> okay. I mean, that's, that's one man equation. Which that's I that's a description I've never heard before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, coming to, uh, you know, more technical side of things, uh, and I think you have beautifully explained that in the big data framework as well. Uh, see, it's, it's, it's all about analytics. I mean, whether it is big data or if it is artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence just helps you to uh, make those analysis uh, much more autonomous fashion. So if I have to, you know, uh, do a, a flow diagram or, or let's say a basic data, a, a time scale in, in that format, um, the first one is uh, descriptive analytics, and then you have diagnostic analytics, then you have predictive analytics, and then you have prescriptive analytics. Now, all these four, uh, you know, work together in, 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 in consensus with each other. And in my opinion, this is basically something which comes in the big data space. Now, one element which big data uh, does not really deal with directly, and that is uh, cognitive analytics. Now, when you talk about cognitive analytics, uh, it predominantly focuses on uh, you know perceived environment, uh, whether it is a autopilot car uh, which has to do decision making uh, in the in in the uh, in the days and in the daytime or or in the night time, uh, the decision making has to be very very human based. Yeah. Uh, or, or as uh, close as uh, a human being would have made a decision. Um, the second thing is uh, personalized characteristics. And this is majorly um, focusing on hyper-personalization. So let's say you and I might have different uh, uh, you know, preferences while we are uh, driving a car or let's say yeah. uh, at, at our home. So how does, how does uh, the existing data of the consumer can help uh, to make those decision making uh, more autonomous, and that's where the cognitive uh, uh, analytics comes into picture, and uh, that is the bifurcation between big data and artificial intelligence, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, I'm, of course, I fully agree with your your description, um, and and I think it, it's a debate that we we need to keep having because um, the the line is so thin because artificial intelligence systems obviously cannot run without massive quantities of data, but um, yeah, it's it's spot on, especially the point that you're making about that personalization. Um, and just as we are making different decisions every single day compared to, let's say, our neighbors, um, that you know, to program that in a computer, that's the real level of complexity. Absolutely. Good. Before I move to our next topic, um, uh, I kind of want to um, um, ask you one more question around the topic of complexity in these larger big data and AI projects. From all of the experience that you have over the years, are there any kind of like key lessons learned that you would like to share with the listeners today? So I think uh, we have covered this question earlier as well. Uh, key lessons is uh, is just to understand, uh, you know, the, the first thing is to understand the business. Yeah, going back uh, to the, the business, I think you the, mentioned that, right? Uh, going back to the business, but uh, uh, not just uh, not just having the presumption that uh, the customer knows the business well. Uh, it is also helping the customer to achieve uh, uh, what they they should they should be able to uh, with the with their existing data and whatnot. So uh, defining those business strategies along with the customer becomes uh, the first first most important thing. Um, I mean, it is always you know uh, it is always easy to uh, have technologists solve a problem using technology or engineering, but more often than not, that is not the right process or not the, not the right approach. Uh, it is, in fact, the, the other way around where the business uh, strategies and, and business thought process should basically uh, drive the, the technology-specific decisions as well. So understanding the business, helping the business uh, or customers to define those business KPIs, um, uh, you know, meeting with the CIOs, uh, CEOs to understand their overall uh, business roadmap. And based on that roadmap, uh, define the data strategy roadmap in consensus with it, with it as well. Can I, can uh, I ask you one more question around that? Because... Sure. Um, um, I fully agree. It starts with the business strategy, and that's always, of course, looking from that, I would say, the IT perspective. How do we do it the other way around? So how do we make sure that the, the, the CEOs and the other business domains become more knowledgeable about Bopic data and AI 
actually can do for them. Because I think that's also one of the key points that you mentioned earlier, that disconnect is sometimes the reason that things are not going as smoothly as planned. So, so how do we do it the other way around? Sure. So, uh, so I mean, there are two things. Uh, I mean, especially the CXO level people. I mean, they they definitely knows uh, the value of uh, data, right? Uh, maybe they, they they are not sure about how that data is going to help their businesses. So, the the win in this strategy is uh, is to make sure that we showcase value uh, with small things, yeah. right? If, if you remember, I talked about outside in in, in terms of thoughts, uh, but inside out in terms of uh, implementation. So the the whole the whole thought process here is uh, whether it is the vendor team or or if it is the organizations who are working towards uh, you know uh, evangelizing the entire data or business roadmap uh, they should formalize teams to help a business to see some of the KPIs so if they see something visual they would definitely believe on that yeah. uh, and not only showcasing the the rosy picture it is also about uh, making some of the transformations. Because uh, we did we did, we did discuss about business strategy and and no business strategy can just work uh, without data strategy. But in order to have a true data strategy, uh, an assessment of uh, data maturity is important. So when uh, when we are targeting a specific customer to uh, help them to aug augment their businesses, uh, it is also important to showcase what is their existing data maturity. And then based on the data maturity, what uh, data strategy has to be uh, created uh, in order to help them to to appraise their data maturity to the, to the next level. Uh, so with with all of these things and showcasing some quick wins in terms of uh, you know some of uh, by identifying some of the key KPIs which uh, really makes a lot of difference. Uh, it might not give them a monetized uh, outcome in the immediate future, but at least it it is good enough for them to invest uh, in the data strategy roadmap for the future as well. Good. So that, according to me, is uh, is crucial. Yeah, I think that's some great insights on, on especially where to get started and, and how do you get the business involved. Good. One of the things that I also noted is, um, and I saw this on your uh, your um, LinkedIn page, is that you've been the the mobile app architect for the Disney parks, which some is maybe probably one of the coolest job titles that exists on the planet. Um, Disney um, and similar companies are quite famous for their approach around user experience. And that's really the topic that I kind of wanted to discuss next with you. The expectations for a user experience at these companies are, I would say, sky high, paramount. How did you incorporate these kinds of expectations and user experience into your technical projects that, uh, that you've been doing? Sure. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I've been fortunate uh, to be a part of Disney for over three years, Jen, where I uh, uh, worked as a mobile application architect. I was responsible for, um, you know, architecting solutions and implementing solutions for their uh, parks applications across the world. Uh, the major, I would not say challenge, the major expectation which business has. I mean, when I say business, it is basically Disney. Uh, they are they are they are truly one of the most fascinating and, and exciting uh, organizations to work with, and their core value proposition is user interface or user uh, experience, yeah. guest experience, as they like to call it as. And of course, uh, um, as we were talking initially about business strategy and technology strategy, and then uh, map mapping these two things together. Um, at the same time, it was also you know uh, very important to come up with uh, constraints, right? Technology constraints. So. Uh, one key thing which which always helped us is uh, to ensure that you know both Android and iOS uh, mobile applications were uh, you know similar in terms of the architecture, so the implementation was architecture neutral. Uh, this also helped the engineers, whether it is an iOS native engineer or an Android native engineer, to you know have a, a common language in terms of communication, uh, and this communication uh, you know. Uh, was driven majorly in terms of how business wanted to have their features involved. Um, of course, uh, back then, uh, I would say almost five years, six years ago, um, mobile applications or let's say mobile phones itself were evolving in terms of their computation power and whatnot. And in the last five years, we have seen an, a true augmentation in terms of how these devices has uh, uh, gained uh, uh, computation power, uh, you know, uh, you, uh, whether it is computation power or battery power, because initially this this was 
a bottleneck for uh, enterprise based applications yeah. so how do you really make sure that uh, your guests are the least one impacted uh, with all the constraints whether it is technology and what not uh, is is basically uh, following the thin client and thick server architecture uh, where majority of the heavy lifting whether it is decision making um, you know um, making any kind of machine learning or ai based uh, calculations or, any, or anything uh, stays in the back end and the user interface is as light as possible as consistent as possible between both the platforms just to give a uh, you know unanimous and consistent experience to the guest yeah. so that was the very high level uh, thought process about how we implemented things with this thing yeah, and and i can imagine that that is kind of a very fine line to walk because on the one hand you have in order to, to develop this good application you have to have all that technical skill on the other hand, as you just mentioned, user experience is paramount and you need to keep your interface uh, light uh, and, and very user friendly, especially across, especially those older de devices. Have you ever been in a situation where these two came into conflict and you needed to make a choice? I would say almost always. <laughs> uh, <Okay>. <laughs> almost always. Uh, see, I mean, as I said, the technology has evolved. Uh, whether you talk about the user interface uh, implementation uh, or whatnot, and and it's not only the computation power or the battery power of the device devices which has evolved over the past uh, few years. Uh, as you rightly mentioned, the the uh, challenge was also to make sure that these applications. Uh, work optimally well in the older devices as well. So how do you maintain a trade-off of uh, maintaining the older devices as well as the upcoming devices? Because the newer devices not only are, are faster uh, with the ever-evolving uh, ecosystem of Android and iOS, uh, they're coming up with some new, new features every year as well. So business wants to make sure that, hey, can we, can we do Siri integration? Can we do voice integration with this and whatnot, right? So uh, the good thing is, the good thing is with this architecture neutrality that we had with both the platforms, uh, it was it was somewhat easier for us to make those decisions uh, in the right format uh, and not impacting only one platform or the other. So of course there were platform specific limitations though, but then um, the whole thought process is how do we make sure that uh, we have a consistent user experience? Um, but more often than not, let me tell you this, uh, user experience was the thing which always won. Uh, okay. Technology has to take in a backseat in terms of technology. That's a good thing. Yeah. So um, um, you say, you know, it, it's difficult to um, balance also those uh, because you, you want to make sure that people who have older devices or um, that don't want to change their devices so often that they can also still use these applications. What is, in your um, opinion, kind of like a, a fair amount of time? Because, you know, we now get new iPhones two, three times a year. Uh, I sometimes even cannot keep up with the numbers anymore. Um, sometimes people who are on devices that are four or five years old um, are, I would say, um, um, having difficulty in terms of speed or performance or they cannot use certain elements. What do you think is a, a fair duration that you can expect as a massive company um, um, to to expect from your users in, in that domain. Any advice? Sure. sure. So it depends from uh, the application. Uh, I mean, it, it depends on the size of the application or the magnitude of the application, right? Uh, so if I talk about enterprise-based uh, applications, similar to let's say uh, Disney app, Disney Parks application, uh, we used to uh, we used to follow a protocol that we will be supporting uh, devices which are at least three years old, okay. three, to, three to four years old. Uh, when I say three to four years old, this also means that people should have adopted uh, the the iOS version or Android version, which was released three years ago. It is not only about devices because um, Android and iOS have been evolving um, for the last 10 years, and uh, they also do a lot of bug fixes and they release those uh, um, uh, very, very frequently. So we, we ensure that as, a, as an organization that we, we support those devices, which are at least uh, three to five years old. And uh, not only that, uh, uh you know with the with the changing technology uh on this on these two platforms um we transition towards uh, a much more leaner architecture on the, on these platforms in, in fact not only on the native development side um, there is also a thought process about movement to uh, a cross native platform i'm not talking about disney i'm just talking about in general yeah. uh, technologies like flutter react native 
uh, where you don't need really two developers to have development on both platforms. You can have a single developer working on two different platforms, basically, uh, or the code gets compiled uh, on the native side on, on two platforms. So that really helps um, in terms of you know uh, having having a consistent uh, implementation and experience on on multiple platforms. I, I think that's a very interesting point. I, I came into contact with Flutter, I think, a year ago, and I was kind of th amazed at the time. I think, you know, this is probably the answer to a problem we've been looking for years, you know, because you had this constant war between iOS and Android and which one is better, and uh, basically meant that you needed to support two products. And now, and, and as you very rightly mentioned, it's, it's becoming easier in that sense, in that you can start to do cross-functional uh, application development or cross-device uh, development. Do you think that's the future? So, We're gonna see more? Uh, that, is, that is definitely the future in terms of, uh, I would say the implementation cost, and, <laughs> sure. uh, the, 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 the development mindset. But you know, uh, one of the other thing which I've seen in the industry these days is uh, people buy iPhone for a reason. Uh, or people buy Android phones for a reason because they want to use that platform. They want to, uh, they want to, you know, uh, feel the 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 good things about using iOS platform or using Android platform. So, with all our good intention of making things platform consistent and you know having having a common design language for both the platforms, sometimes I believe users' perception about the platform changes. Uh, or about the application changes. So it is very important to also ensure that uh, uh, with all the changes which, which uh, uh, you know, technologies like Flutter, React Native, Xamarin and other things are doing, uh, we should always try to make sure that the, the core offerings of these platforms uh, remain intact because that's the primary reason why uh, the user is buying those uh, devices yeah. uh, for that matter. And then basically uh, mend your um, user experience uh, based on those platforms and that format. Yeah, I, I would even go one step further and say that they they're actually you know devoted to one or the other platform. I, I don't absolutely. I don't really see a lot of people switching back and forth. It's it's Indeed. really very very strong preference. So yes. in, in the applications that that you mentioned that, that you developed uh, also for you know these mass user applications. Were there already uh, first versions of machine learning and AI algorithms available at that moment? And were they integrated within those applications? Or is that not something that, that, that you encountered at that period? I believe, see, I mean, impression analytics is something which was very, very important for Disney Parks application, especially from a guest, pers from a guest perspective. Okay. Uh, so let's say if someone is going to Walt Disney World, uh, in in um, uh, and and he or she is using the application. Uh, what he or she is browsing, right? What kind of uh, food he is interested to buy in and whatnot, right? Uh, that impression uh, uh, was going to be captured, and then the recommendation based on the food preferences or uh, based on the time of the day uh, was was being given to the. The so recommendation uh, the engines user. were included. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So it does have. Uh, see, I mean, Disney definitely believes uh, a lot on, uh, you know, having a true, uh, seamless and, you know, hassle-free guest experience. Um, and hence, you know, having a recommendation which helps guests to make decisions with uh, less or no cognitive load uh, is the best guest ex experience. So, I mean, they definitely invest a lot on uh, providing that, uh, uh, you know, recommendation in that format. Good. I'm very interested to hear that. Did you, did, did you ever get the chance to um, um, see whether your solution works in practice? So uh, did you have a chance to visit the parks? Yes, yes, I did. Uh, so I, I went to Walt Disney World uh, uh, two times and uh, it was it was interesting to see, you know, how does uh, uh, the application is being used by the guest? Uh, how do they, you know, how do they connect with it? With it? So it is not only about uh, using the application uh, just from a usability perspective, and you know that also helped me and my team to understand uh, how deeply people are connected emotionally as well yeah. uh, with those applications. Because uh, going to the parks, like what you said, uh, is one of the best things which, which people uh, look forward to uh, with their families, and they want to have a truly seam seamless experience. Whether it is uh, you know uh, onboarding into the resorts, purchasing tickets, uh, you know buying food uh, in, uh, in the restaurants in, in the in the in the park. So all of that is is absolutely incredible to uh, watch out for. 
must be so cool to walk around there and then look at the app and then thinking, you know, we actually created that. It must must be absolutely fulfilling. Uh, uh, indeed, indeed, indeed. In fact, it is not only about uh, uh, being proud of creating something like that, but it was it was also about. Uh, you know, uh, understanding the problems that the guests are facing. Yeah. So we, we also used to do a lot of guest service to understand what kind of problems they're facing and, and how can we constantly improve those applications as well. Yeah, as I mentioned before, it's probably the coolest job title in the world. Anyway, Indeed, yes. um, I, I was wanted to kind of uh, pick your brain a little bit around the future uh, and the future of app development, machine learning, AI, all the things that we've been talking about so far. In the domain of, of application development, um, basically what you're reading everywhere is augmented reality, uh, virtual reality in applications, in theme parks, uh, basically in everything that we're going to be doing. What's your view on this? So uh, augmented reality, uh, virtual reality, mixed reality, this is something which is absolutely necessary in my opinion to provide, a, 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 you know, a truly uh, Intriguing as well as uh, seamless guest experience. Um, just we talked about can you, yes. uh, for the for the people who uh, have no clue and just hearing this for the first time. Can you just briefly explain in one or two minutes what's the difference between augmented reality and virtual reality? Sure, absolutely. So augmented reality is something which is basically uh, you know uh, you you augment a, um, a real thing in the virtual space. Whereas when we talk about virtual reality, it is the real object in the uh, in the virtual space, for example, uh, when you use Oculus Rift uh, uh, as a, as a headgear, right? Yeah. So you're uh, an individual who is the real person in that, but you are into the virtual space. So that is more about virtual reality. Now, augmented reality is uh, you're augmenting uh, a virtual space in the real, uh, a virtual setup in the real space. So that's the primary difference between augmented reality and virtual reality. Uh, there is also something which is mixed reality, which is a combination of these two. Um, uh, right, and and if you see uh, things like uh, Google Glass or Apple is also coming up with uh, uh, Apple glasses, um, you have a, a transparent kind of a glass where you where you are engaging with the real world as well as you are you are also having a virtual setup as well. So that is more on the mixed reality space. So uh, in my opinion, uh, these technologies exist for the good. It is not only about uh, you know, uh, providing uh, a, a true uh, centric uh, 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 great experience to the customers in terms of usage of their applications and the products. It is it is also having a lot of benefits, whether it is in the medical uh, medical field, right? Where, yeah. the, where, where the doctor will have to, let's say, provide some kind of surgeries and they need some, uh, some augmentation or some kind of uh, uh, precision to be done by uh, some of the expert, uh, experts who are not there physically. So uh, things like virtual reality, augmented reality plays a lot of role in those spaces as well. Uh, gaming is another area which is uh, which is uh, uh, the, the the last one, but not the least one to mention, uh, has been evolving uh, a lot because uh, you know gone are those days when you and I must be playing uh, games uh, on a computer uh, just as a passive. Uh, you know, as a past passive participant, but right now with uh, with the entire augmentation of virtual reality, you can be an active participant within the game as well. So this has truly created an immersive experience across uh, different different areas, and I think it is going to evolve uh, even more. So so uh, using the same algorithms, the same uh, um, AI algorithms, big data algorithms like classification, clustering into the domain of VR. Is, is Absolutely, yeah. indeed. Absolutely. Good. Um, this has obviously been in the news uh, quite a lot in the last two weeks. Uh, Facebook announced that they're going to change their name to the Metaverse, something I, I needed to look up. Uh, and ever since, it's been exploding on the Internet. Basically, it's their view of this integrated world between all of those virtual reality, augmented reality applications and the real world. And as you just mentioned, walking around with your Google Glass or Apple Glass or whatever brand you, you choose to use at that time. Is there going to be a moment that we cannot differentiate anymore from what is real versus what has been a virtual uh, experience? What, what's your view on that? That's a great question, Jan. And I would say, uh, see, that differentiation has already started to diminish. Uh, I mean, these days, maybe we are not feeling it. I mean, we are engaging with our phones, with our laptops, uh, majority of the time during the day. 
right i mean it is not only about the the professionals like like us uh, it is also for people who are uh, constantly using smartphones and what not so somehow i believe uh, a digital replica of ours is already created uh, we have to, we we know about digital twins right so uh, uh, the big giants are using this data of ours uh, because without this data no one can put us the recommendation right what what shoes you want to buy what garments you want to uh, purchase right or what movies you want to watch so i think that parallel universe and that's what metaverse is all about right creating a parallel universe which is predominantly uh, you know depending on the data from the physical world and then uh, helping you to have uh, a seamless experience so i believe that world already exists it is just a realization of it to the larger uh, format as well but i do see a lot of uh, you know uh, uh challenge itself also is is in terms of how do you do identity prevention right so technologies like blockchain would definitely be uh very important uh in in this space so because the moment you create a digital identity how do you know that your information is not getting uh shared with other participants right or it is not being uh, misused by by people who are not intended participants of those of that data so technologies like blockchains um, blockchain uh, distributed ledger technology would be per amount of um, making sure that the transactions on the digital space whether it is metaverse and what not um, is secure uh, and it is immutable so uh, in my opinion we are already living in that metaverse uh, uh, generation it is uh, it is just that we are now realizing that this is going to be um, uh, more formal than than ever before yeah one of the points you're bringing up i think is is something really interesting i want to ask you one more question around that is there's always a bit of this debate is you know is is this real progress or you know there's also a lot of drawbacks um, we read a lot about isolation of people uh, the the un- ability to make a differentiation between what is real what is virtual um also things indeed as you mentioned from a security perspective or from a fraudulent and 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 criminal uh, perspective because that's also of course fueling a lot of this this development if if we make up the balance is the metaverse going to be more positive for society and maybe this is a bit of a philosophical question or uh, should we put a limit somewhere i would say it is too early to uh, make a judgement on that in my opinion um, <clears throat> we know uh, the augmentation of technology what it can achieve uh, we know how it can help us to uh, to achieve what we want to achieve um, but as you rightly said there would be there would be constraints there would be concerns um, i would i mean as i mentioned about data security it is one of the biggest concern which is which is out there because uh, although we are sharing information right now we both are talking so of course some information is being captured somewhere else as well so how secure is this information uh, someone would be uh, very very intrigued to understand that uh, and uh, you know not only about uh, i mean in addition to data security in general uh, one important thing which is which is the biggest drawback according to me is uh, losing out on the uh, physical connect yeah. right uh, in my opinion there is no substitute to, uh, to physical connect um, you know because human emotions um, or let's say uh, capturing and understanding human thought processes uh, can only be done better in terms of uh, you know uh, connecting with people in in, in person then having an an uh, a digital form of uh, myself or you you uh, which which has some 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 predefined algorithms and it does behave in, in certain way so i think we we are still a uh, long shot in terms of adopting it uh, in terms of society um uh, but in my opinion the the physical connect should not go away uh, come come what may i mean whatever advancements we want to make um so these are the two things which i would like to mention yeah and um one i was at a conference a virtual conference obviously um in the last year and i as one of the speakers there there's uh, some that that was follows in the sense that um we're more connected than ever before yet there's also more people that are more lonely than ever before and i think that that's kind of sums up what what you're saying as well absolutely because if you see uh, the 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 entire ecosystem of uh, this digital uh evolution which has happened in the last decade or so i would say last two decades when the social networking uh, uh platform came into picture right people started not having physical connects but just having 
this virtual connects and remote connects, right? So of course, this has helped in 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 uh, in a greater dimension in terms of providing the information, providing it seamlessly, providing it consistently. But at the same time, uh, this has lead to loneliness and depression in people as well, which is which is a big concern. Which I think. Uh, businesses should also have that uh, uh, thought process uh, in an empathetic format that how can I make sure that uh, even though my, um, you know, my customers are using my product, uh, they are they are still, they're, they're not really getting engaged to it. I mean, just to give you a good example, right, you know, uh, uh, Apple watches or let's say smart watches, uh, the creation of that uh, product itself uh, was done just to make sure that how can you lower down your screen time on your devices. Uh, there, there could be just notifications that you need to uh, take care of. And um, I remember a few years ago when Apple Watch was introduced and Android Watch, Android Wear was introduced. Um, the thought process was it is going to lower down your screen time on a mobile device by 75%. But I don't see it happening in, in, in reality. That's our, it's completely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Good. So, um... Obviously, it's it's so great to talk to you because you have so much experience in in this field. Um, in my last uh, conversation of Big Data Talks, I had a guest, uh, Dr. Kebe. You might have seen seen the episode, yes. and um, one of the, the very famous questions he answered, and and we had a lot of discussion around that, is now that you have all of this experience, you've been in this this domain for 10, 20 years. Um, if you were eighteen again. And you can choose to study anything in the world. You're you're young, you're you're fresh. Um, what would be your advice? What should people do? So uh, I would pick up uh, quantum physics. And quantum quantum mechanics. physics. Wow. And uh, the reason is I'm I'm still intrigued in terms of all the advancements which is happening in quantum mechanics, uh, quantum computing. Yeah. And I think uh, this is definitely going to uh, speed up the entire uh, you know computation power uh, in, in in the world. I know companies like Google and, and other companies are making a lot of advancements into that. So yeah, I mean, if, if I if I were given a chance, I would have definitely loved to uh, you know study a lot more about quantum physics. Wow, that's a really interesting and very cool area to to uh, to focus on. And that's definitely I, I don't know a lot about that, but maybe I should invite a guest uh, to kind of specify on that topic as well. Absolutely. Good. As, as you know, I, I wrote the Big Data Framework, and, and one of the reasons I did that is because I'm a, a big fan or advocate for the standardization uh, of these kinds of best practices and making sure that there's a more uniform approach. You've done the certification. That's also one of the reasons uh, how we got into contact. Uh, are you using any parts of the framework in, in your organization or, or any um, ideas that, that were part or that, that guided you on that? So first of all, congratulations on that uh, uh, on the creation of that big data framework, Jen. Uh, I mean, uh, when I uh, studied about it uh, earlier this year, uh, it definitely resonated a lot in terms of what we are doing internally within Global as well. Uh, I think we have a lot of things in common in terms of uh, you know how do you uh, prioritize business strategy at the, at the core, and then how do you define a data strategy roadmap and whatnot. So uh, uh, one good thing that I really like about your uh, framework offering it favorite favorite framework offering is it is not uh, you know linked to specific technology um, and it is basically uh, not also linked to a specific domain yeah. uh, and that is in my opinion a true differentiator in terms of creating a vendor agnostic and architecture neutral uh, kind of a framework uh, from a big data perspective. So that's one thing which I really liked about the framework. Thanks. That's really cool. Very happy to hear that you're actually using that. Um, I'm always also always looking for um, gaps. So if we look at the domains and everything that we've talked about, where do you th where do you see gaps in terms of knowledge, um, 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 machine learning, and big data, everything that we talked about? Are are you experiencing in in the projects that you're working on any significant gaps that you think need to be addressed? So. Uh... Gaps, in my opinion, um, is 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 majorly in terms of understanding the the business, um, right? And 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 then mapping that business KPI with the right uh, data strategy KPI as well. So uh, and this is not only true for uh, let's say the managers or let's say people who are at the higher uh, levels in the organization to to sort out for. 
right? I, in my opinion, it is it is true for all the data engineers, data scientists as well, uh, to understand how their algorithms, how the, how the work that they're going to do uh, is going to be connecting towards making a product, right? A data product, which is going to solve a business problem for the customers. So uh, that's one gap, which I think, uh, uh, it has to be resolved and uh, see, I mean, as I mentioned, uh, frameworks like uh, the big data architecture, I mean, the big data framework, which we have created or the ones which we are following at Globe and the whole thought process is how do you keep uh, business strategy at the at the base of the platform or, uh, or you create the platform as a business strategy and you build everything on top of it and not the other way around. Um, and this is something which has to be constantly evangelized uh, and advocated amongst, uh, you know, different forums. Uh, different places uh, and also educate people that hey uh, your job is not just to uh, create models just because you're a data scientist your job is also to understand uh, how your data model is going to help to solve some uh, some business problem yeah. at a, at a large the relationship level. back towards the business that's correct yeah good Avi I have one more question for you uh, before I need to let you go um, and I think you might actually like this one um, we, we recently launched the big data framework ambassador program and the reason that we did that is that we're, we really aim to build this community of, I would say, global experts across the world who have, um, um, you know, structured train of thoughts in these kinds of topics. And I would be really honored if you would like to join this ambassador program. Would you accept my invitation? Absolutely, Jan. Uh, in fact, I think I will be honored to be a part of the semester program. And uh, as we have been discussing uh, earlier this year as well, um, the the time when I was introduced to the big data uh, framework by you, uh, I, I see that uh, there is a need to, you know, as I said, uh, uh, basically uh, having an education uh, across different areas and uh, uh, people like us, and, and of course, um, many more people. I don't consider myself as a, as the expert in that. Uh, we we need to form a strong community of uh, thought leaders uh, in the big data space, where which can work very closely with the uh, with the business people, right, and help them to solve some problems uh, together. So yes, absolutely, cool. I'm, I'm happy to have be, be part of that. It's really great to hear from a, a thought leader just as yourself, and I'm I'm really happy that you uh, will be joining our community. Avi, um, unfortunately, we're, we're getting towards the end of the program. We're past the hour. Uh, from my opinion, I, I really always like doing these kinds of episodes because, first of all, I learned something completely new myself. And it's also so great to pick your brain on a variety of different topics. So thank you so much for joining today. It's, it's greatly appreciated. I can see you're very, very passionate about the work that you're doing and I'm pretty sure that it's going to reflect with our audience and viewers as well. So I hope that this uh, um, episode inspired everyone to, again, think about data and how data is changing their lives. And obviously that it will help people on their journey to learn more about the way in which data is changing our world. Thanks so much for joining today, Avi. Thank you so much, Jim.